Okay, so our second talk is titled SMURF, Scalar Multiple Precision UNM Risk V Floating Point Accelerator for Scientific Computing. And it will be presented by Andrea Bacher. Paco. It's not the eye, does it? <laughs> so, hello to everyone. My name is Andrea Bocco. I'm a PhD student coming from uh, France, actually working in uh, Grenoble in the CEA Leti Research Center, and I'm belonging to the INSA Lyon uh, Doctoral School. And I'm here to present you my paper titled uh, SMARF, Scala Multiple Precision UNO RIS-5 Floating Point Accelerator for Scientific Computing. Uh, what about the state of the art? Uh, variable precision computing has been uh, investigated to uh, converge algorithms based on the multiple formats. Uh, basically, it was investigated under the two different perspectives, uh, either in software, either in hardware. Uh, all the investigations done uh, in, uh, in software were based on uh, the software libraries like GMP and uh, MPFR. Uh, but since they are software uh, libraries, they generally are uh, slow and uh, they may not meet uh, I, the performance for high speed uh, applications. Then, uh, other investigations on variable precision were done within hardware. The, according to what they investigated, my, the two main contributors are uh, Kulish and uh, Schulte. Uh, Kulish dates under, uh, in the 60s. And uh, basically his idea is to have uh, a very large uh, fixed point accumulators able to uh, map uh, all the possible floating point numbers according to the exponent range. Then uh, the second contributor uh, is uh, Schulte with uh, Schwarzlander, if I pronounce it correctly. And uh, basically here uh, the idea is slightly different from uh, the one of Kulish. Here the idea is to um, extend the mantissa inside the floating point uh, uh, scratch pad uh, according to the precision that uh, you need uh, supporting up to a given number of bits divided in multiple words. Uh, but none of the previous work actually managed to store out uh, this variable precision floating point numbers in, uh, in memory in a suitable way. And uh, basically what they do every time that uh, uh, a variable cannot stay in the floating point uh, uh, unit scratch pad, uh, basically they convert it back in the IEEE in, a given, in one of the three formats and uh, in this step you will lose precision. Uh, now I move on my work. What I am uh, presenting is uh, my, my unit that I call it SMARF. But, uh, as I told you before, it's a scalar, multiple precision, UNUM, RIS-5, 14-point accelerator. And uh, basically my unit is another accelerator which supports the UNUM type 1 in uh, main memory uh, up to uh, the UNUM environment that actually corresponds to 256 bits of uh, Mantissa. Uh, it supports internally another type of format uh, which can be extended up to 512 bits uh, of Mantissa and uh, it supports also interval arithmetic because the UNUM type 1 supports interval arithmetic. Uh, now we move on the choice of the UNUM format. Uh, as you know, the UNUM type 1 uh, format has six subfields. The three standard one, like uh, IEEE, uh, which uh, are sign, exponent, and fraction, then it has three additional uh, fields, uh, which uh, self encodes the, the, uh, the number in the sense that uh, we have the exponent size, which tells the size uh, of the exponent, and then the fraction size, which, which actually tells the fraction size of the exponents. Then we have an additional bit, is the U bit, which actually is done to support interval arithmetic inside the number. Uh, why we choose uh, UNUM uh, type 1? We choose UNUM type 1 because, it's the, as the best of our knowledge, is the, uh, is the only available variable precision for the point format in the state of the art. And then it, uh, it also self handles the exponent and fraction size fields width. Uh, however, uh, the UNUM type 1 uh, format has uh, two peculiarities. Uh, one related to uh, handling the UNUM arrays in uh, main memory, and another one uh, related to how to organize the UNUM subfields in main memory. 
Uh, now let's focus on the, the first one, how to organize unomar arrays in main memory. Let's imagine that we have uh, two different numbers, uh, two, num two numbers with two different lengths, and uh, then we want to store them in memory. Uh, we identify two possible uh, addressing modes to store those numbers. The first one, we call it a concatenated uh, array. So basically, we try to compact the array, um, the um, array elements uh, in memory as much as possible uh, in order to minimize the memory footprint, like was proposed in the Jones book. Uh, however, if we uh, want to um, overwrite uh, a given element in main memory, this element may not fit, uh, the new element may not fit in the previous position. So we have to reallocate the pool array and that costs thousands of clock cycles because normally our, uh, the reallocation of array is done at the operating system level. Uh, so we will go to support the, the second uh, addressing mode. Basically this addressing mode uh, we, um, we uh, reserve for each number uh, enough space in uh, main memory in order to store the maximum length of, uh, of each number. In the case that we want to overwrite uh, a given number in main memory, we have still room to, to overwrite it. And then uh, uh, that's actually uh, with the second array support, we uh, guarantee a fine memory access. That is something that uh, uh, is not possible to guarantee with the previous uh, addressing mode. Then we move on the unimo field organizations. And uh, actually here we are proposing uh, to reorganize the unimo fields uh, for the scalars and uh, for intervals. And uh, why we did that? Because basically when we will get a load operation in main memory, we will start to read in a given address. Let's, uh, let's assume address uh, one. But uh, we know just what is coming in this world, but we don't know how much our number actually is long. So uh, we decided to put all the uh, informations about the, the length of the number at the beginning of the number, such as when we're going to uh, actually read this number, we are actually able to know where all the other units of fields actually finishes. Uh, and that's our, uh, how our numbers are stored in memory. Uh, now we start to move in the, actually, uh, in the other architecture, and uh, we basically did the big decision to uh, keep UNUM and uh, UBounds as memory formats. Then uh, all the data are actually processed in the, inside the unit, uh, in the unit scratch, but in a dedicated floating point format. Uh, basically, we took the, the short uh, floating point format where we have uh, the mantissa that is uh, always uh, normalized. We decided to divide it in uh, eight chunks up to 64 uh, of 64 bit each for a global of maximum 200, uh, 512 bits of mantissa. Sorry, and the exponent is uh, explicit and signed. And then we have an additional field L, which actually tells us how many chunks of the mantissa uh, is made out of the maximum one. Uh, then the conversion between uh, uh, memory format and uh, the scratchboard format uh, is uh, actually ended by a dedicated load and store unit. Uh, then uh, we decided to integrate our system in a RIS-5 environment. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, here there should be some numbers, but actually here I'm messed up in this version of slides, I don't know why. Uh, we took the rocket chip uh, genera generator in order to generate uh, our RISC-5 environment. Uh, and uh, our environment is made of a rocket tile, uh, done of an uh, integer um, processor, the RISC-5, with its own dedicated uh, floating point unit, its own dedicated uh, load and store unit, and then the memory hierarchy. And uh, the rocket chip uh, distribution allows us to uh, interface with a, a rocket um, interface uh, up to four coprocessors. In our system, we use just one coprocessor. Uh, this coprocessor actually is the UNUM uh, coprocessor accelerator, where it has its uh, load and store unit that actually handles the conversion between data in memory and uh, variables in the scratchpad. 
with supports like the RIS-5 uh, 32 variables in the, in the inside the, the scratch pad, and uh, the conversion between uh, Unum and U-Bond is done by the lowest of unit. Uh, the coprocessor internal parallelism is uh, on 64-bit, uh, and that choice was made in order to keep the outer complexity uh, of the coprocessor under control, I would say. And uh, we support three uh, status registers. Uh, the first two are related to the load store unit and uh, are the default and the secondary Unum environment, which actually we use it in the, during the load and store operations. And then we support the WGP uh, status register, which actually stays for uh, working Gilarian precision. Uh, basically, uh, the, what is the working GPU precision? Let's imagine that we have uh, two variables in the scratch pad, uh, in our scratch pad register file, the uh, variable uh, 3 and the variable 7. We're supporting interval arithmetic, so we have two endpoints for each variable. Uh, each uh, variable uh, may have a different length in the in the input, and with uh, the working GPU precision, we are guaranteed that uh, each operator actually outputs at most working scenario precision chunks in the output. And uh, that choice uh, is done in order to uh, give to the user to exploit the latency over precision trade-off uh, during the computation. Uh, now we move on the instruction set architecture. Uh, we basically decide to extend the RIS-5 instruction set architectures. And uh, the, the extension of uh, for our coprocessor, you basically divided in four groups. We have the first group that is uh, dedicated for the updating or the um, internal status registers. Then we have the second group that is dedicated to move inter uh, internal variables uh, within the coprocessor scratch pad or uh, between uh, the scratch pad and the main RIS-5. Then we have the standard operations, such as uh, comparison, addition, subtraction, multiplications, and then other two that if you want to detail, I can uh, tell you after what they are. Uh, division is done by software. And then the fourth group is the, are all the load and store operations for the two addressing mode, with, uh, which actually I presented you before. Uh, what is the microarchitecture of, of my unit? Basically, my coprocessor is divided in a three-stage pipeline. We have the decode, the execute, and then the write-back stage. We don't need the memory uh, stage because actually the addresses are already computed by the integer, inter integer main processor. Uh, I don't want to dig too much uh, into the details. If you want the details, you can ask me afterwards. So what we have in the decode, uh, is, uh, in the decode stage, we have uh, our register file, which actually is our scratch pad which is a register file uh, with has, uh, two reports, one report, and it, is, it supports up to, uh, no, no, up to, it supports 32 um, intervals uh, inside, uh, done with uh, the format that I explained you before. Then, uh, uh, in the execute stage, I have uh, as many operators uh, that I need in order to support all the instruction set that they present you before, and then I have the dedicated uh, load and store unit, with, uh, which actually uh, supports the uh, conversion between uh, the scratch pad format and the memory format. Um, one important contribution that uh, we did, we decided to organize uh, our uh, pipelines inside the operator in micro stages. What is a micro stage? Uh, basically, uh, it's a hardware uh, which implement a basic operator on the mantissa, so move, addition, subtraction, multiplication, leading zero count, etc. Uh, it reads uh, the data from an input mantissa buffer. Uh, it is doing computation chunkwise, uh, and uh, that actually has a variable latency uh, depending on the precision of actually the input mantissa has. Then it writes the result in an output uh, buffer and it's synchronized within other um, macro stages uh, with a redivided protocol. That actually is basically a stop and wait uh, protocol. Uh, in this way, uh, this is something really important, uh, the complexity to handle the multiple chunks uh, of Mantissa, which actually complicates each basic operation, it's actually ended by each macro stage. So the designer, when I have to implement the operator, has uh, simply, I would say, 
just picking the basic operators, uh, put them in a pipeline, and then uh, implement the floating point algorithm. Uh, and which floating point, with floating point algorithm, I don't need the Fourier transform. I, I mean uh, each basic operation, so uh, the addition, it has a, a shift, then a done, and so on. Uh, now I move on the results of our implementations. Uh, basically, um, we, made, uh, we validated uh, our unit uh, testing each subcomponent against uh, something like 50 million of uh, pseudo-generated input vector in order to check the validity of, uh, uh, of the behavior of our unit. Uh, we implemented uh, our C, we, we prototyped our uh, system in uh, FPGA using a uh, Xilin V37 uh, FPGA, and here we are able to run at 15 megahertz. Then we did also an ASIC uh, synthesis simulation, uh, ASIC synthesis, sorry, in uh, 28 nanometer uh, technology, and here we managed to run at uh, 600 megahertz. Uh, moreover, uh, the critical path of my unit is not passing. Uh, the critical path of the system is not passing through uh, a microprocessor, but is passing through uh, the standard floating point unit. It's something <coughs> I would say. Uh, and here are all the details about the synthesis for area and power. Here, basically, uh, there is uh, the most important units uh, that, uh, that I have, and they try to isolate the contribution of area and power uh, consumption for the internal mantissa buffers. And uh, basically, what I got is that uh, the Mantissa buffers has an important contribution in both area and power. In area, uh, they take the 67% of the coprocessor uh, area, and in power, they consume the 20% of the global power consumption of the coprocessor. Uh, however, we could reduce uh, those impact, optimizing the circuit, uh, something that I, we didn't have time to do. Uh, oh. No, here there is a very big issue with the slides. Um, okay, I try to to re uh, reinvent the thing. Uh, basically, here is the plot chart for the uh, ASIC uh, area and ASIC power uh, consumption. In green, we have the uh, coprocessor uh, subunits. Yellow is the uh, integer uh, register. Sorry, the the mayor is five. In uh, light orange is the standard floating point uh, unit. And here we have the caches, the instruction cache and the data cache. Same color code is used for the uh, ASIC power. In ASIC power, the blue is actually the power consumption uh, consumed by the clock tree. And that's uh, standard. It takes almost the half of the power consumed in, uh, in a circuit. Uh, what, we what we measure globally? Uh, the smart coprocessor is uh, um, compare, uh, we compare the smart coprocessor with a uh, standard 64 bit floating point unit, so it's not really a fair comparison because actually our coprocessor supports 312 bits of mantis, uh, and we compare it with a standard IEEE floating point unit of 64 bit. Uh, our coprocessor is nine, nine times bigger and consumes uh, 12 times more uh, power uh, energy. However, um, the flow performances of uh, our coprocessor are comparable with uh, a standard 64-bit uh, single precision fl uh, floating point unit. And uh, we want to highlight that uh, our coprocessor is not meant to substitute uh, standard floating point numbers. Uh, because actually standard floating point unit for small precision they works really, really well and they are really optimized in uh, energy uh, consumption. Uh, but uh, uh, we want to use it only when it's needed, our coprocessor. So when we want to uh, do high precision computation, we start to use UNUMS and uh, we will do uh, our computation in UNUM. So in all the times so that we don't need, for all the time that we don't, we don't need uh, variable precision, uh, all this circuit behaves as dark silicon. So actually we are consuming power uh, only when we need variable precision. Uh, then we move on uh, an experimental software setup uh, to show you how we program uh, our uh, coprocessor. And uh, here I showed you the, an example of how to programming uh, the division inside my, my core. Uh, 
uh, we the rocket uh, chip distribution actually gives us also uh, GCC uh, uh, support and uh, in this GCC support it allows you to uh, write inline assembly for your coprocessor uh, and basically we uh, develop uh, the, um, our division uh, it actually is called there with a neutral Rapson approach and uh, basically here we are comparing uh, the performances in uh, flops, uh, looking at the core of the neutral Rapson uh, computation. And uh, our flop performances spans between 5 and 54 megaflops. Uh, 54 megaflops is for 64 bit internal precision, and uh, 5 megaflops is for uh, 512 bits of Matisse precision. Uh, if I try to uh, implement, the, to measure the performances of this, uh, of this part of code with MPF file, which is actually a multiple precision software library on 512 bits uh, of precision of Mantissa, we can run at uh, one, uh, one megaflop on RIS-5. So we managed to be five times faster uh, compared to uh, MPF file. Uh, and then, uh, if we try to compare, it's not fair, with a 64-bit floating point unit, actually we are running four times slower compared to a 64-bit floating point unit, but we are doing different operations. We are, we are uh, ending different procedures. Uh, we, now, we are also working on a real programming model for uh, variable precision floating point kernels because actually we want a system which actually supports multiple floating point formats and uh, it uses a variable precision floating point formats uh, only when it's needed high precision. Uh, moving on the, the conclusion, uh, this work proposes a, a variable precision uh, floating point hardware accelerator based on uh, RIS-5. We provide an instruction set expansion in order to show to the community how we, we, we could use a coprocessor in order to implement, to support a different uh, floating point format. And uh, this MARF is implemented as a RIS-5. Uh, it supports uh, Unum U-bound in uh, main memory and it uses a different uh, floating point format for the scratchpad. In main memory we support different Unum environments according to the precision that uh, uh, is needed by the algorithm and we support all the Unum environment from 1-1 one, one, which means uh, two bits of exponents and two bits of mantissa up to the 4-8 which, which corresponds to 16 bits of exponents and 256 bits of mantissa. Uh, internally our, we can reach a precision up to uh, 512 bits to mine a little bit the, uh, the Coolish accumulator. Um, we have uh, uh, internal fixed um, parallelism at uh, 64 bit. Uh, about the air and power, we are uh, nine times more air consuming and 12 times uh, more energy consuming compared to a standard floating point uh, uh, unit. But uh, uh, we plan to use our circuit only when it's needed. So when it's not needed, it behaves just as a dark silicon. And the flow performances uh, of uh, our coprocessor are better than the currently use the state of the art, which is actually a software library, which is MPF4. Uh, with that, I finish my presentation. Here there are my contacts, and if you have any question, I will be happy to answer you. Thanks, Andrea. I think we have plenty of time for questions, if there are any. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm Jon Peltmer from uh, TU Delft. Can you speak Very louder, a, please? I'm sorry? Can you speak louder? Uh, yo, oh, Thank that you. works, yeah. Yes. So uh, Jon Peltmer from TU Delft. Thank you for your presentation. Very impressive. Lots of work done. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that the critical path um, for the FPJ implementation was actually in the, in the floating Both point part. ASIC and uh, actually ASIC. Not FPGA, but it's, it's ah. the, it will be exactly like the same. Yes. Okay. So, so I was wondering if you take your um, unum unit out of context, uh, what what then would be the critical path in your design? Uh, I try to rephrase your question. Basically, you are asking uh, which is the which will be the critical path if I remove the unum. 
form no. no, no, I'm I'm asking it the other way around. So if you re remove everything except your unit thing, so if you take it out of the context of the whole system, what what, what was then the critical path? Uh, uh, it would be uh, inside the multiplier of my unit. Uh, that's uh, kind of counterintuitive. Uh, but you have to remember that uh, our circuit is organized in microstages. Actually, the conversion uh, between G bounds or internal format, uh, shooter format, call as you want, and the unums uh, is complex, but not so complex. Actually, it takes a lot of pipeline stages more compared to uh, IEEE because we have to uh, realign, uh, identificate. Uh, our uh, exponent and uh, mantissa fields like in posit and uh, um, then uh, once we convert with this we are uh, ready to go in uh, uh, in the scratch but uh, then for uh, for example for the multiplier is slightly more complicated because if you look inside the multiplier uh, since we are supporting uh, multiple chunks we have a fused multiply accumulation multiply accumulate uh, unit which actually have to multiply two chunks and added with the previous one, and uh, that actually takes more than uh, the other uh, micro stages. And since the pipeline uh, actually has the same data as the uh, uh, additional one, but as this uh, component, which actually takes more time, the critical path passes there, and uh, we are able to run. Uh, I don't want to say uh, fake things, but I guess around uh, seven hundred or, or eight hundred megahertz. Actually, I don't remember because I did this measurement just once. Now the design has been a little bit evolved, so I don't remember actually it is uh, frequency correct. Uh, I hope yeah. To, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so is your work open sourced somewhere? Sorry? Did you open source your work uh, somewhere? or? Uh, no, it's not open source because I'm working in the CA Research Center and there's a really strong uh, uh, internal policy about uh, spreading uh, okay. the code. Okay. So actually, I would like, but I couldn't. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. John has a question? It, it looks to me like you're comparing unum operations, which are interval bounds, with straight floating point operations. Shouldn't you be comparing against intervals done with floating point arithmetic as the input points? You actually have a bigger advantage than you're describing because there's a lot of work in doing both the upper and lower bound of an interval versus just making a guess of a, a rounded floating point number. Uh, actually, here we are mixing two things, I guess. Yeah. The first one is two that I'm comparing a scalar hardware operator with an interval hardware operator. But um, it's true that uh, I have to guess the middle of the interval if I want to keep scalar. But actually, my coprocessor is also able to do scalar operations setting the rounding mode in a single uh, interval length point. So actually, I could set instead another status register that's actually in supporting scalars. And then all the operation could be done in scalar using just one uh, hardware and point computation. I see. And then, uh, if we now the, the work is uh, moved on. Thank you for also the question because now, uh, in a second word, it will be maybe published in the future. Uh, we measure that uh, actually uh, doing the computation fully in interval, uh, it's I would say unfeasible due to uh, the interval explosion properties uh, during the operations. But however, intervals are uh, uh, very useful in terms of uh, uh, error computation. Uh, so we want to keep uh, the interval support, but uh, only in software and not in hardware. Uh, so if we go back in the uh, area and energy consumption, you can assume that you could uh, split by 2 plus uh, minus 20% of the measure that I gave you before, roughly. I hope to have uh, answered your question. Thank you. What uh, hardware implementation approach did you use? Did you use Chisel or VHDL or? That's a good question. Uh, the, um, the rocket ship is uh, generated in Chisel and then implemented my unit in uh, VHDL. I don't use very long because uh, in Europe we, we got VHDL teached in the university, <laughs> but uh, I use VHDL. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you too.
So we're on to our 